Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 21. We're going chronologically through the life of Jesus, and I think this is the first time we've actually gone to Mark for a passage. Because quite often Mark is very succinct in <laughs> what he provides as far as information. Um, Mark's of course, Mark's telling of the gospel is mostly gleaned from the teachings and sermons of Peter, so they're very action-oriented. Go do something! <laughs> it kind of fits Peter's personality. And what we're going to see today, um, it's very action-oriented. It's just Jesus one thing after another after another. So, oddly enough, Mark's account of it is actually the most detailed because these are details that Peter paid attention to. Or the Holy Spirit pointed out to him more than <laughs> the others. Uh, last week, we saw Jesus calling um, four disciples, three of him, three of which would form his inner circle, Peter, John the Beloved, James, his brother. Uh, in calling them, Jesus also gave them a preview of what their lives would look like um, during his ministry and more importantly after his death. This is what I'm calling you to. Fishers of men are going to do amazing things that nobody expects or understands. Today's events um, that we're going to look at are also recorded in Luke chapter 4 verses 32 through 41 uh, and a very small portion of it is covered in Matthew chapter 8 verses 15 through 17 and oddly enough Matthew's the smallest retelling of any of these events and yet he has one huge detail that none of the others do and I'll bring that in a little bit So we are going with Mark's account, Peter's account. Um, so huh, I guess I didn't put that very good marker there. <laughs> Oops. I think John is ready, right? I think we are about to be enjoined by <laughs> fellow travelers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. That's all right. We're glad you're here. Yeah, really. Far more glad you're here than what time you got here. Past cushions. You got enough cushions? You got more. This is going to look really good. All right. John chapter 4, verse 21. Chapter 4 or chapter Mark. 1? You mean Mark, Mark chapter 1. Gosh, I actually went <laughs> to the Matthew passage. Gosh, yes, Mark chapter 1. Mark 1, 21. 21. 21. 21. <laughs> Try this again. We're all good systems. Thank you. <laughs> then they went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teachings. Teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Do you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Now as soon as they had come out, of the synagogue, 
they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever, fever left her, and she served them. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick and with various diseases, and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak, because they knew him. Father, thank you so much for loving us, for loving your creation enough to send your son into this world. And thank you, Jesus, for being willing to go, for stepping into our history and changing the entire course of it. And we look at these miracles that you did and how you loved on people and took care of people, people who really didn't deserve it no more than we deserve your blessings or your love or your salvation today. And yet you did it. You just loved them and took care of them and blessed them and healed them and freed them from oppression because you're that good, because you're that beautiful and that kind that loving and we ask now that you would fill this place with your spirit and your spirit would move in each person that we would hear exactly what you have for each of us in this passage don't let a word come out of my mouth that you don't place there and in everything let your name be lifted up and glorified and exalted and all this I ask in the beautiful Blessed name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So, picking up at verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue and taught. They then, or then they went, this event immediately proceeds. Jesus is catch a fish, preaching on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. This is immediately following that. So it's a sequence of events. Immediately following Peter, James, John, Andrew walking away from everything, they all head into Capernaum, which is <coughs> John and James's hometown. And apparently it's where Peter has moved to because they, as we saw last week, they work in partnership as fishermen it's a small world in Galilee. <laughs> and immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue. Luke 4.16, which we looked at a couple weeks ago, tells us this is Jesus' custom. It's just what he does on Saturdays. If you want to find Jesus on a Saturday, he's in church. If you want to find Jesus on a Sunday, he's in church. And he's not there to get anything for himself. He's not there because he needs some spirituality or some fellowship. He's got all of that better than any of us could ever hope to. Jesus is there to serve. He came to teach out of the Holy Scriptures. Get an idea just for a minute of what this is. No, we're in a bookstore. Jesus is in a church with the Bible <laughs> teaching out of it. This is an in-store author event. <laughs> <laughs> An in-store author event. Meet the author. Meet the author. Get insights to the book that nobody else has because he wrote it. And when you think about it, you know, after um, 
his death for our sins on the cross and all that that sacrifice brought for us, this has to be at least the second greatest thing that Jesus could possibly do for us. Mm -hmm. To open up the scriptures and explain them to us. Mm -hmm. To give us a first-hand account of what he was thinking when he told this guy to write this. It's a picture to the heart of God, and you get it from God Himself, the in store author of that. The Bible lessons from the author. Do you think anybody there grasped what they were being blessed with? And then you have to ask after Jesus' death, did people stop and think, go? Oh, I was with that guy. I, you remember when he came down to the synagogue and he was teaching? And he spends quite a bit of time here and he spends a lot of time in the synagogue. I wonder, do you, do you go, we were at the end star author event. It was so cool. I, I, I knew him before he was famous. All right. <laughs> Just I used to play with that dude. <laughs> <laughs> and so it makes me it makes me wonder a little bit about heaven. Um, will we get to heaven and just suddenly know everything, know as we are known, just like mm -hmm. Paul says, or or will we will we get day after day of just sitting at Jesus' feet? and letting him explain himself to us. <laughs> Will we just get a millennium or, or a, an eternity of awe and wonder each day sitting at Jesus' feet, hearing him tell us mm -hmm. of the wonders of himself? And I could argue it either way. I could really go for just knowing everything, but there's just something this, yeah, no. Jesus time. Let's, let's, uh, it's time to get up. It's time to go. It's hey, move it. It's our turn. <laughs> no, uh, I wouldn't do that. Heaven, though. Like, brother, is it my turn yet? No. <laughs> um, but imagine that. Just we'll get that someday. We'll get that someday. Maybe he will tell me everything, and I'll just play stupid so I can get some explanation. I just. But just the thought of sitting at Jesus' feet and hearing from his own mouth the wonders of what he did and accomplished, and mm -hmm. it moves me. Verse 22, And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Three words here we're going to dig into to really understand exactly what this passage is telling us. The first word is astonished. It's explaso, explaso in the Greek. The first meaning is to beat out or expel by blows. The third meaning is struck with amazement. So literally what's being indicated here is that they are blown away. <laughs> It's, this is not just a, oh wow, that's cool. This is, this is, this is jaw-dropping, I bugged out, what's going on here? Second word, teaching. The King James Version actually uses the word doctrine. It is the Greek word didache, or didache, depending on whether you pronounce it properly or like a me. Um, <laughs> And it does mean teaching, but more importantly is the sense in which it is that which is taught. Doctrine, teaching, concerning something. So it's not just Jesus' teaching or his teaching style, it's what he is teaching. It's different, it's unlike anything they've heard before, and their slack jawed eyes bugging out over it. And the third word, is authority. Exousia. 1 
first meaning is power of choice. Liberty of doing as one pleases, physical and mental power, the power of authority as an influence and of right or privilege. He taught it like he wrote it. He taught it like he knew it better than anyone had ever known it ever before <coughs> in all of time. Mm -hmm. And the people were absolutely astonished by it. The last part of this is not like the scribes. So we know it has to be opposite um, background. The way scribes taught, scribes, their job was to copy the scriptures. We didn't have printing presses. They sat around all day. So I'm sure they knew many, 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 many passages by heart. What they didn't know was anything about them. They knew of them, they knew what they said, but they didn't know anything about them. So when they taught the people, they spent all their times quoting famous, well-known rabbis or re leaders of rabbinical schools such as the Shammai school or the Hillel, the elder school, the two major schools. I don't think they were divided between Pharisee and, and Sadducee at that point, but these were the two major schools two major rabbinical thoughts, and they just spent all their time, well, there's this passage, and Rabbi David says that it means this, and, and Rabbi Hillel the Elder says it means this, and Jesus just got up and said, it means this. Jesus didn't have to quote anybody. <laughs> Everything he said was a quote. Jesus was creating quotes not using them. Jesus taught like he wrote it. Verse 23. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit and he cried out. At this point I, I, I have to ask it just <clears throat> and maybe this is far too deep a view into my process but um, so if he's beginning to get afraid. Did this guy just wander in? Was he there the whole time? I mean, is Jesus in there teaching and some crazy guy just walks in? Or is there one guy sitting there and then all of a sudden... <laughs> and why pick this moment, this exact moment, to cry out? We don't get any any hint that he wandered in from the outside, that he wasn't there all along. He was just in the congregation and all of a sudden, boom. Jesus is, it, it just said he, he's teaching doctrine with authority that they've never heard before. Teachings that are blowing people away. Maybe the demon was afraid he's going to get through to them. He's going to make a difference. Maybe just in this guy's ears. And so I'm just going to make as big a commotion as I <laughs> possibly can because this has to stop. This has to end. And we can't be dogmatic about it. But looking at the text, part of this is really quite frightening because it's very obvious that the devil and demons are really not afraid to go to church. We get this picture in the movies that we have sacred holy ground over here, and if I could just get into the church, if I can just get into the consecrated graveyard of the righteous dead, <laughs> I, I, no, no, there really does not appear to be. They, they go before the throne of God. There really is no sacred ground. There is no special place where you're safe from evil. They're not afraid to go to church. They're not all-knowing. They're not omnipotent like God. They do know their ultimate end, and we'll see that in a minute. So why are they there? Um, I think they're just as curious as human beings. It, 
I, I know they have some view of the end times, but how everything's they're spying, infiltrating, mm -hmm. sowing dissension, causing strife. Mm -hmm. What better place to go to work? Let's face it, the guy who's staying home watching football is really not a threat to the kingdom of hell. <laughs> He's not. Mm -hmm. But the church is. Mm -hmm. Those people get on fire. If those people hear a message, that that's where we need to be. This is where we're concentrating our efforts. This is where we're... That whole thing of special concentration. All Hollywood. There's only one thing that sends demons away the word of Jesus, or of someone in whom the Spirit of Jesus dwells. Other than that, they come and go as they please. Perhaps, and I even wrote this and didn't do it tonight, but maybe we should spend our time or some time. That prayer we have at the beginning on Sundays, praying away these guys, because they're there. We did that this morning. You're good. Oh, okay. We do that every morning here. Yeah, but yeah, I'm just saying. True. Because uh, they're there, and they're working to undermine God's efforts. They're working against the kingdom. And maybe it would do us some good to spend some time at the beginning of our services Clear in the room. Clear in the air. <clears throat> and I say it frightens me only because I don't think about it. There's nothing to be afraid of. Jesus has given us authority over them. We can take it. We can clear it. But you don't think about it. Uh, my favorite quote from a non-Christian movie of all time is... <laughs> Kaiser so say in The Usual Suspects, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he doesn't exist. We forget about him, we don't think about him, and he's sitting in the pew next to us. Or he's all hunched up on the back of your brother or sister that, not afraid, but I let my mind slip into apathy I let my mind slip into not thinking about it. It's the last thought, not one of the first. And so let's think about that. We got that prayer time. Let's let's clear the room. Verse 24, saying, "Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us?" I know who you are, the Holy One of God. At first, it was the man crying out. Notice in verse 23, it specifically says, he cried out. But here, here the demon is taking control of the man's faculties and is doing the talking. Notice the plural, let us alone. The man was possessed and the demon is thing has manifested itself and taken over this poor guy like a puppet. To try and, if it's not obvious what's being said here, uh, let us alone. This phrase is actually a single word in the Greek. It's a, or e-a, I'm sure that's not an E, but it looks like an E. Um, it's an interjection expressive of indignation or of wonder mixed with fear. Derived apparently from the imperative form of the verb, verb E-A-V, this is E-A, of, a, or derived from of, which means to let alone. According to others, a natural instinctive sound such as ha or aha. So this guy is sitting in the synagogue. Jesus gets up, starts to speak, he's teaching, and suddenly the demon 
is sucking air. <gasps> <laughs> I know who this guy is. Maybe he didn't recognize his physical form, but when Jesus started teaching, mm -hmm. there's only one guy, only one guy that knows this, only one guy who can teach like that. And suddenly this demon mm -hmm. is sucking wind. And he manifests. I don't think this guy was like the demoniac that we think of where he's cutting himself and living in there. This is just a normal guy. This is just a normal guy who has a supernatural hanging on, a supernatural indwelling. Again, making people believe he's not really there. He can infiltrate, he can get inside and then just cause trouble. We all know those people that just seem to come into a church to cause trouble. It happened then, it can happen today, and we need to band together and pray for these people. Mm -hmm. Not run them out, but love on them and try and run whatever's inside of them or on them out. It happened then, it can happen today. So I think this was a very subtle form of possession. But at this point, oh crap. That's interesting, quite well. The demon is startled by Jesus' presence, and frankly, he seems a bit ticked. Hmm. And the essence of what he seems to be saying is, what are you doing here? The inference of the Greek words of why, what, what do you, this is our place, this is, this is, this is our place, this is our realm, our, you got up there, we got down, what are you doing here? You don't belong here, back off and leave us alone. Jesus spent 40 days being tempted by Satan himself, the chief you would think he would have warned the others <laughs> that Jesus was walking around. Because this guy seems to be completely caught off guard. Sent out a little demon gram. He's walking around, a little picture, a little mental something, and this guy's just... And he's afraid. Pure, unadulterated fear. The demon knew exactly who Jesus is, and he's trembling. Notice he knows his fate, his ultimate end. Whether he knows all the steps in between, he knows his ultimate end, his destruction, at the hands of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Did you come to destroy us? Jesus is the guy in charge. Verse 25, But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Notice Jesus does not make a big, flowery show here. He doesn't debate with him. There's no long conversation. What do you mean, what am I doing here? I made all this. He doesn't have to state anything. He doesn't have to exert or, or profess his power or his ability or argue for his rights, zip it <laughs> and leave. <laughs> Showing he had total and complete authority. We all know those people that they get put in a position of power and they have to exercise that power like asking somebody to leave or telling them it's time to close. I'm the store manager here and it is time for you. Because under code 237, of, Jesus doesn't have to do any of that. Total, complete authority and power. Zip it and leave this man alone. Verse 26. 
verse 26, And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. He does not go quietly, but he goes nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Luke's account of this event has a few details. In Luke 4.35, But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Mm -hmm. I think his whole point was to disrupt these people from hearing the words of Jesus. And actually on some level it kind of works. Because everybody's talking about what happened instead of hearing the words of Jesus, what he taught, what he understood. That was where they had started. Wow, this teaching, this is amazing. Where they're going to end was, whoa, did you see that? <laughs> and so on some level, um, he's kind of successful. And, this couldn't have happened had not God allowed it to happen. He was trying to out Jesus. I know who you are. <coughs> so in his final act, he, he flops this guy in the middle of the synagogue like a fish flopping around. But it says he wasn't hurt. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He made provision for all of it. Notice also it does not say Jesus drug him out. Drug the demon out of the man. It says he came out. He left under his own power. <coughs> Jesus has absolute authority and the demon had no choice but to comply. And part of me just wonders... Is this why demons hate us? Because when Jesus tells them to do something, they got to do it. And Jesus has given us all kinds of, well, two main ones. Love God with all your heart. And love your neighbor as yourself. And yeah, we do whatever we want. I'll come back to this a little more at the end. Verse 27, then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. So the word amazed here is used here. Um, the Greek word is not the same as was used for astonishment. It's a completely different word. And it means astonishment mixed with fright. Scared amazement. Scared astonishment. <coughs> Whoa. A little chill runs down your spine. <laughs> what was that? I mean, this guy's flopping on the floor. He's talking in strange voices. Suddenly he just gets up and he's okay and the voices are gone. What just happened? That was freaky. That was weird. I, I don't... Astonishment mixed with fright. The one word that really kind of threw me off here, I had to spend some time looking and trying to figure this out, was what new doctrine is this. And it seemed an odd place to throw in the word doctrine. It's actually the same word used for teaching in verse 22, didache. And frankly, it puzzled me. So I did some digging. And we can all agree that what Jesus has just performed here is what today we would call an exorcism. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it was called something very similar back then. This was not a new thing in Israel or even the Middle East for those matters. Um, the Jews of the New Testament actively believed in the reality of Satan and demons. Satan being the chief, he's often seen in Jewish writings and literature and teachings as almost a rival to God, to Yahweh. 
demon possession was a common malady of the day. We don't see it so many times in Jesus just because he was it had been going on for years and it continues after he's gone. Prior to this, um, it, it was so People had been seeking healers who could rid people of demons for a long time before Jesus arrives on the scene. In fact, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, written prior to Christ, an incantation designed to cast out demons was found written in some of the ASEAN's personal writings about their communities. The non-scriptural writings of the ASEAN's, they found a rather long incantation written specifically to cast demons out of people. Or so they thought. <laughs> they were actually active in Jesus' day. Mark 9.49 records another exorcist, or a itinerant Jewish exorcist, who used Jesus' name to cast out demons. That's the one where the disciple, he's not one of us. Jesus, hey, just go cool if he's not against this. He's and the practice would continue after Jesus. Acts chapter 19, the sons of Siva, the most heavy metal story in all of the Bible. <laughs> Seven guys casting out demons and they get their butts handed to them because they weren't doing it. So th this is not a new thing. Demon possession has been going on amongst the Jewish people in all the Middle East, and I'm sure all of the world, um, for a very long time. Jewish itinerant exorcists of the day performed elaborate rituals, often with esoteric objects such as amulets. That sound like any? Um, any religions we know today? Phylacteries, which were the little boxes they would wear on their heads or wrapped around their arms that had um, Deuteronomy 6 in them. Or, or if you get the deluxe version, the viscera of animals or fish. The people had come to believe that it required an elaborate ritual and incantations to free a man of demon possession. Frankly, I highly doubt it ever worked, but this is what they come to believe because this was the process that everybody saw prior to this. Jesus has come along and is now saying or teaching through showing, through actually doing it, that it's not rituals or special objects that can cast out demons, but simply a command from one who has authority. Who could possibly bestow or have that kind of authority? But God. Nobody. This is a sign. It's a miracle. It should have made them at least ask the question Is this the guy? Do you think this is him? Do you think? Instead, they're asking, what, what's, what's going on? This is so weird. What, what new doctrine is it? Who, who is it? <coughs> Not once do you hear him ask me, is this the Messiah? Do you think this could be the guy we've been waiting? No, no, why? It seems like the most obvious question. They ask a lot of other questions, though, but fail to ask what would seem to be the most obvious. Are you the Messiah, the Holy One of Yahweh? Verse 28. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. The word fame specifically refers to hearing or a thing heard in the Greek. Another way to say this is immediately it was heard by everybody. It was heard about the Galilee region. It was in everybody's ears. And it spreads, specifically it says, to the region beyond Galilee. 
Galilee is surrounded by the regions of Decapolis, Samaria, Phoenicia, which would include Tyre and Sidon, and Galantis, which is right bordering on Syria. All of these are Gentile lands. The next Jewish province would be Judea, and you have to go through Samaria to get there, or around through the capitalists. And <coughs> Jesus' fame is spreading first to Gentile lands, to Gentile peoples. And we will see later that they start bringing boatloads of people to be healed. It's just really interesting that Jesus' fame really starts to catch on in the Gentile lands surrounding Galilee. I'm not saying there weren't any Jews in there, but they were predominantly down. Samaria, there were no Jews there. Um, Tyre and Sidon, the Phoenicia area, that, that really wasn't. There may have been some in the, we know there were some in, in the Decapolis and possibly Galantis, but by and large, these are Gentile regions controlled by Rome, and this is where Jesus' is famous, famous spreading. I just thought it was very interesting. Verse 29, Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. <coughs> we know Simon and Andrew are from Bethsaida, but apparently he now resides in Capernaum. One of the strange things, we've actually been to this place in Capernaum, and it's just a little, it's just a really small place. And, and having four, four fishermen and, I, and an itinerant Jewish rabbi walk into this place would just about fill it up. <laughs> I mean, it just isn't a whole lot of room in this house, and it's about to get a whole lot more crowded. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. Luke's account of, of the same event gives us a detail not in Mark's account. Uh, Luke 4.39, So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. Jesus commanded the fever to leave, and it did. This is exactly how Jesus had just dealt with a demon. The same authority. Authority over sickness, over illness. I searched, and I wanted to see that this was a spiritually or demonically influenced it's not supported in the Greek and I don't think that actually is the point because there are lots of sicknesses and illnesses that were caused by spiritual oppression this isn't one of them this is specifically a fever an illness burning fever burning hot fever if I remember properly in the Greek this is exactly how Jesus handled the demon so why would we, Peter's mother-in-law, begin serving them, and why would all three accounts record this detail? It seems gratuitous, or almost, depending on your mindset. What do you mean she got? She's been sick. You guys got no compassion, you know. Care for this woman who's been sick, and she get you. Know, why would you even let her get up and give you a cup of tea? Because that is just wrong. But there's a point here. There's always a point with Jesus. It's to show the supernatural nature of what has just happened. What usually accompanies a very high fever? Nausea, body aches, headaches, sweating, loose bowels, dizziness, dehydration. It wasn't just that the fever broke 
and she was on the men or getting better, every symptom that would accompany a fever was gone as well. She was, at a word from Jesus, completely made whole. Her sickness wasn't just that. She was good as new. Like it never even happened. That's the point of including that detail to show us it was a supernatural healing. It couldn't be attributed to anything. Well, that just happened to be the moment that her fever broke. Good for Jesus being in the right place at the right time. Mm, no, no. Everything was gone. We all know what fevers do to us, especially high burning fevers. Is, it wipes you out. This detail was included. Jesus let her serve them so that they could all see what the complete power he had over the human body, over illness and sicknesses. There's always a point with Jesus. Amen. At evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. At evening seemed like an odd detail. Now remember, they have just left the synagogue. It's the Sabbath. The Sabbath day begins at sunset on what we would call Friday. The Jewish concept of time or of a day is from sunset to sunset. Not morning to morning as most all other cultures count it, or midnight to midnight as we do today. The way God sees it, because God was the one who, they didn't come up with anything. This is all what God told me. <laughs> from sunset to sunset. So you start with the darkest part of your day and then you go into the glorious, beautiful sunrise. This is actually an important concept to understand other things in the Bible. Chief among them would be Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and how that all works. Knowing that Jesus that the day started at the evening helps figure out those days. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at that and going, this is just a, see if you can plug in, day starts at evening on what we would call the day before. To, can't go completely into it, but it's an awesome idea. It's an awesome <laughs> thing. <you know? laughs> But this tells us something of the condition of the people who were being brought to Jesus. They were unable to make it on their own. The fact that they had to come after sunset implies that they had to be carried. Because they could have just wandered in on their own anytime during the day. They're allowed to go. So. But if they had to wait till sunset, if they carried them during the day, if their relatives brought them during the day, they would have been bearing a burden. So this little tiny detail is to show us how horribly sick, disfigured, maimed, completely out of their minds from demon possession that these people want because they needed help. They couldn't get there on their own. This was way more than just a few colds and fevers. These were very sick and ill people. Verse 33, And the whole city was gathered together at the door. This would be an incredible scene, really. There had to be hundreds of people living in Capernaum. Just looking at the layout of the town as it existed, and all these little blocks of, of buildings, all sharing common walls, because if you just built onto what somebody else had, you could save yourself potentially at least one wall, if not two or three. So you just keep adding in to the sections and, and these little narrow streets, because there weren't cars, you didn't have to get anything down it except your big fat butt and a horse <laughs> occasionally, maybe a donkey and a cart. You just didn't need a whole lot of room. and. That's more stones you had to haul because it's cobblestone, and these are just tiny, narrow streets. And the whole town is just gathered, trying to get a peek into the doorway <coughs> of Peter's house to see this miracle worker. 
this compassionate, loving, kind miracle worker who with a touch or a word can heal or free. Verse 34, Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Matthew adds some details. When evening, Matthew 8, 16, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. Luke tells it this way, Luke 4.40, When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Mark here tells us that Jesus healed and freed from bondage many. Matthew and Luke tell us, both of them tell us, that not a single person was turned away. Everybody brought to him. Jesus had time for a touch or a word. In these tiny little narrow streets, just getting someone up to, now we know why they had to lower somebody through the roof in a couple <laughs> years from now when we get to that. Um, <laughs> this is, there, there's no room, just getting someone up to the front of the line and then after you got getting back out so the next person could come in, it took time. And Jesus had time for everyone. Everyone, not a single person was turned away. I'm going to come back to the final part of this verse in a minute. The demons knew his name. Didn't let him speak. Matthew also makes a correlation that was not revealed by Mark in this story or Luke. Matthew being Jewish and one of the followers, actual followers of Jesus, um, seemed to take a special interest in correlating the life of Jesus to Old Testament prophecy, and that's mm -hmm. exactly what he does here in Matthew 8, 17. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Having just talked about all these healings, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. This is a quote or a paraphrase from Isaiah 53, 4. The most beautiful messianic prophecy in all of the Bible. And Matthew, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, shows us that this, what's just happened here, that Jesus' healing ministry is literally the fulfillment of that prophecy. We see that the very acts that Jesus is carrying out before the people's eyes, the miracles that they are lining up for, are the fulfillment of a messianic prophecy. And yet they don't see it. Even the, even the disciples don't really get it at this point. They have a clue but not much of one. Maybe a little more than most people, but they really don't get it. It would seem that the only persons who know who Jesus is are Jesus and the demons. <laughs> and that makes it all the more amazing that Jesus didn't turn. We don't see after this passage that Jesus gained a whole lot more disciples or people started following him. In fact, it looks like it was just the people of Capernaum who turned out. And Capernaum is one of the towns that Jesus curses because they don't turn to him. Mm -hmm. If Sodom and Gomorrah had, or Tyre and Sidon had seen the miracles worked here that you saw, they'd be repenting in sackcloth and ashes and you don't. And yet Jesus didn't turn a single one of them away. Mm -hmm. Come on, let's face it. If we knew we were doing... <clears throat> bonus material healings on the people of the town and not a single one of them were going to acknowledge would you have quit after five or 
ten. Everybody sees how awesome I am now. I'll just keep shut the door, catch me some Z's, because I gotta get up early, pray, and catch some fish, and throw out some demons. And my Messiah needs to sleep, you know. That's what I'd be saying. Jesus knew these people were gonna all turn on him, and he healed every one of them. He didn't turn a single person. I am so glad that God's mercy is not dependent on my faith. Amen. I am so glad of that. <laughs> so what was the purpose behind this day's event? Um, there's a bunch of them. Um, the obvious, to bless the sick and free the oppressed and Capernaum. We just saw it was to fulfill prophecy. But I think there's a slightly less obvious one. He was further revealing himself to Peter, Andrew, James, and John, three of which would become his inner circle. And Andrew wasn't far outside of. Andrew was the guy who was always bringing people to Jesus. He brought Peter. Peter wouldn't even be in the inner circle if it wasn't for Andrew. Andrew was the man. Andrew brought the little boy with the loaves and fishes. Andrew brought the Greeks who wanted an audience with Jesus just before the cross. Mm -hmm. Andrew's secretary in chief. If if uh, you know Peter, James, and John are vice presidents, then Andrew's you know CEO or something. He, he, he's right there. <laughs> and, and Jesus is here to further reveal himself to them. Mm -hmm. We saw last week. And when they were called and when they came, Jesus showed his power over nature. I can make fish go anywhere I want, anytime I want. He said it with a whole lot more humility than I'm capable of. But now he has just shown, notice in that first verse it said, they entered Capernaum and on Saturday, the disciples are in tow. All of this. He's showed him earlier his power over nature. Now he's shown him his power over the supernatural, over the spiritual world. I can condemn and command demons to leave with a word. Zippy, go. And I have power over disease, the human body. Jesus is showing his power over some of the curses that were put on man when he fell. <clears throat> at one point Adam was naming the animals and after the flood animals are afraid and gee, I can just fish here disease was never a point it was never a part of God's design I have power even over that demons and it's also just like the fishermen, to show them what they would soon be doing in his name. This is how you do it, and I'm preparing you. He's preparing them for when he is gone. He's in essence, through all these events, saying, you will do what you have seen me do, just like I do what I have seen my father do. I'm preparing you. John 15, 19, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Jesus is setting up the same relationship that he has with his Father, with his disciples. This whole thing, this whole thing, two days worth of events is all about teaching the disciples. There weren't any converts that we hear of. We've already talked about how Capernaum as a whole won't turn to Jesus and going to be wiped out. These days events were a continuation of the lessons that were begun on the Sea of Galilee. It's all building on itself. It's all building together. The 
kind of wrapped this up. And I said I'd come back to Jesus. Demons acknowledge the deity of Jesus. On some level, as I mentioned, they seem to obey him a little better than many of us do. <laughs> Get out, go, and he does. <laughs> Stop doing stupid stuff, but I like it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> the demon doesn't go, I don't want to. He just goes. Kicking and screaming, but he goes. <laughs> and I'm going, I like it here. <laughs> and yet, they are condemned to destruction. And frankly, this should frighten us. This tells us it's possible to acknowledge Jesus and acknowledge even the sovereignty of God and still not be saved. So why aren't demons saved by acknowledging Jesus and the sovereignty of God? What are they missing? Because they obviously have to be missing something. And I turn to my favorite quote from one of my favorite teachers of all time. My, my mentor, Mr. John Piper, says, the devil has had more theologically accurate thoughts about God in the last 24 hours than you will have in a lifetime. Do you believe that? I do. I think he's brilliant and he knows God inside out and hates what he knows. Mm -hmm. Satan's problem is not doctrine. It's delight. Mm -hmm. Therefore, getting our heads straight won't save us and it won't glorify God by itself. And I hope that you know, and I share this sentiment, I'm really big on doctrine. <laughs> but I'm at this point saying the reason I push joy in God is because all the right thinking about God in the world is not as good as Satan's thinking about God. He just hates it. Mm -hmm. Saving faith is not an acknowledgement of who Jesus is. It's delighting in who Jesus is. It's not knowing that he's the Son of God. It's being overjoyed that he's the Son of God. Amen. The difference between us and the demons is delight. What do we delight in? Do we delight in God? Are we... Jesus is the most incredible gift that God could have ever given. Are we overjoyed by that? Are we thrilled by that? Or are we just really glad that we don't have to go to hell? God created us for relationship. And there's different levels of relationships. There's people you know, people you run into. <clears throat> but I don't think that's what God's looking for. That's not why he created us. That's not why he came down in the garden in the cool of the day and walked with his creation and talked with them and spent time with them and brought his other creations to him to name. God desperately, deeply desires a relationship. An intimate relationship and that requires some delight. There's a reason why God calls it a marriage and he likens it to and Paul follows that same imagery. It's an intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. The difference between us and demons, the reason we can be saved is because we can delight in God and they never can. <clears throat> but you have to ask yourself, am I delighting in God? 
is that the thing that brings me at least some level of joy? Am I really excited about who Jesus is mm -hmm. and what he's done for me? This is an amazing passage. I'd love to see the way it all builds together. But at the same time, it frightens me because I don't want to be the guy that at the end Jesus goes, yeah, didn't we cast out demons in your name? And didn't we do great works and miracles? And Jesus goes, nah, no, I never knew you. I think what Jesus is saying, you never delighted in me, you never loved me, you never cared about mm -hmm. me. I don't want to be that guy. So I'm praying, and I'm asking God, help me love you more than anything. And that's where the fruit comes from, and that's where the power comes from. A relationship with the Creator. He can cast out demons, He can end disease and all the effects of disease with the Word, and we can know Him. In this life, now, today, know Him. That's something to be excited about. Yes. That's something to delight in. And that will set us apart from the demons. Amen. It's on the cross. Jesus bought it. Let's get it. Let's ask for it. Help me to delight in you. My beautiful blessed, loving Savior.